This is Twit. What did you think of the 3900X uh, compared to the 2700X and, and compared to what's available from Intel? If you look at some of the charts, the 3700X and 3900X have tremendous performance. It, depending on the benchmark, they sometimes even lead on single core performance. But really where they their bread and butter is going to be multi-threaded. So if you have a multi-threaded workload and, you know, Cinebench numbers, that sort of thing are what they are. And of course, the 3900X absolutely dominates that. But depending on your workload, you're getting just phenomenal power from this because it's 12 cores. If you compare it against anything on Intel's desktop side right now, where it tops out eight cores, 16 threads with the 9900K currently for around $500, 3900X at the same price point, if you can find it, you're just, you're getting the, the benefit of all those extra cores, which that's everything. So it's it's four more right. cores, eight more threads, and it, it looks like it in the benchmarks. It's not like this is falling short of the 9900K, even though it looks faster on paper. It looks faster on paper. It's faster in real life, depending on the benchmark. And we'll talk about gaming, but just for any of the quick benchmarks I was able to run, I, I did as many as I could, but you're talking about things like video compression and or you know transcoding compression decompression with 7 zip uh, i ran uh, one of the older cpu pov ray it's a cpu based uh, ray tracing benchmark center bench just to get a feel for what these could do in single and multi-threaded mm -hmm. performance versus intel and it was great i mean the older pov ray intel kind of wiped the floor on single core but then of course you go to multi-thread which is how you're actually going to be running it and it just destroys the five hundred dollar ninety nine hundred K. So it, they they definitely lived up to the promise of the benefits of the new architecture and moving to seven nanometer. They're able to do things like the thirty seven hundred X, which is only a sixty five watt part, and frequently outperforming a ninety nine hundred K, which is rated at ninety five watts. But you know everything consumes more power under these. Mm -hmm bigger loads like Cinebench is almost a power virus when it's running in all core mode but <laughs> the 65 watt 3700 x was not pulling very much power out of the wall even under that kind of stress i think the total was around 130 watts which includes the you know the motherboard the chipset the memory and then the inefficiency of the power supply which in this case i think was only a gold rated power supply so you have to discount that as well but just very very impressive uh, yeah, 132 watts from the wall was the 3700X. And if you That's look impressive. at... Yeah, and look at like the previous generation. The 2700X was pulling 203, exact same motherboard, exact same power supply, right. everything the same, except I swapped out the CPUs, ran the test again. You're going significantly better performance than a 2700X for the same price, yet you're drawing 70 fewer watts in the process and don't need the same kind of cooling like the 3700x is not a hot cpu so oh, it's, I was, it's, it's no i was gonna say I, I, that was one of the craziest things because you pointed out that uh anantec has this fantastic discussion of the chips and the architecture um but you know they were saying like they were looking at something like the neighborhood of 32 percent lower well let me it showcases or it manages to showcase 32 percent lower absolute power than the 2700x comparing the, the 2700x and the 3700x yeah. um that's really impressive you know to boost clock speeds by 100 megahertz to you know boost uh the amount of work that's being done and to lower the power consumption um you know, this is, you know, this is the kind of things we were looking at Intel and being amazed by a few years ago. And now AMD is doing it sort of at a much more accelerated pace, it feels like. I mean, that's a, just a huge drop. How much of that do you think is due to the 7 nanometer process or moving down to the 7 nanometer process? We were talking about this uh, here, and it's, it's, some of it is 7 nanometer for sure, but the architecture is really where they made these huge leaps in performance. So, Mm -hmm. Like we saw with Radeon 7, you can move down. Essentially, Radeon, Radeon 7 was a die shrink. It was taking right. the Vega chip that was shipping in the Vega 64. Same configuration. It was still 64 CUs, same number of streaming processors. They increased the memory. They boosted memory throughput because they added two more memory channels, that sort of thing. But essentially, you're dealing with the same GPU die, just 
die shrink down to seven nanometers and clocked up. So it pulled almost the same amount of power, but they were able to get higher clocks. And when you go down to a smaller process, you can make choices like that. Like, do I want to focus on efficiency? So if they could have they could have done this with the 3700X versus the 27. They could have said, let's make something that consumes way, way less power, but you know, still has the same level of performance. And what they were able to do because this architecture is so much better Zen 2 versus Zen Plus, it's just not even mm -hmm. close. The, the biggest right. jump on the charts is going to be going from Zen Plus to Zen 2, way, way more than we saw from, from Zen to Zen Plus. Zen Plus was really just a die shrink where they kind of massaged it and got some more performance out of it. And Zen 2 was just all new architecture and way, way more efficient. Everything from the very beginning uh, cache is another big one with these cache sizes have, have gone way up and that helps them. And the way that the CCX units are communicating is different. Everything has been improved and we've seen the benefit where like the 3700X, it comes out, it doesn't have to be clocked way up to give you higher right. performance. But at the same time, because they didn't have to be really, really aggressive with the clocks, they didn't have to be they didn't have to take that hit on power, so they could release that part at 65 watts. Now, the higher clock 3800X, that is 105 watt TDP part. Right. And that's where they made that concession from power to just raw performance. And then the 3900X is 105 watts as well. But the, the amazing thing will be, and however long it takes to get enough of these, since obviously the 3950X will be a, a higher bend part, that's got all 16 cores enabled and running at higher boost clocks, even though the base clock will be a little bit lower. That's going to be ridiculous at 105 watts. I would love to see how much actual power that that pulls, but, you know, this <laughs> is just... It, th this has basically obliterated the market. I, I mean, I say that, and of course, anybody who's watching at Intel or anybody who has Intel systems and they have spent 1,200, 2,000 or more, 3,000 dollars on a CPU doesn't want to hear that this $500 CPU is is eating their lunch but really Intel has to revisit their high end desktop pricing at this point because a 12 core 24 thread part from Intel is $1200 so right. for $1200 I can buy a 3900 one theory I could buy a 3900x a decent motherboard in the 2 to 300 dollar range memory storage and a cheap case and power supply and throw a system together so it's it's for enthusiasts. This is an amazing time, and I I wasn't around for you know, I wasn't covering this stuff when Athlon first came out, or when the Athlon XPs were kind of dominating things in the enthusiast circles, and Pentium Four right. was considered kind of a slow platform, especially the initial launch where it was using Rambus before they went to DDR two or DDR. So I mean, there have been times in history where. AMD was the, the the lean and fast enthusiast platform, especially for gamers. And then it was like the core came out. Core 2 Duo was what got me back onto Intel. And it's been several years where every build I did was Intel, Intel, Intel. And, you know, Bulldozer, pile driver, those were disappointing to say the least. <laughs> Terrible memory performance, bad overall performance, architectural issues, and... It's it's kind of all changed, and I think their their only real complaint about Zen before, and one of the things that Intel would have been quick to point out was like the CCX to CCX, like this, the actual um, they were basically like NUMA nodes. You had different CPUs communicating with each other over memory, and so performance was greatly affected by memory frequency. It's far less so with these new processors. Clearly, using faster memory is going to be an, an advantage. And AMD would love it if you would run at 3600. And they sent out 3600 memory with the review kits. But I was running all my tests at 3200 with some G scale memory that's been around here for a while for testing APUs. And it ran perfectly fine and was very competitive with Intel on a clock for clock basis. Even though, and I know I've been talking for a while, but even though if you actually look at gaming <laughs> benchmarks, that's where Intel still has the advantage. So if you are absolutely gaming first. I don't care about multi-threaded workloads. I don't care about rendering. 
I just want to play games at the absolute highest frames per second, then you would still buy an Intel processor, which that's probably not what AMD fans want to hear, but it's not huge. It's not the big lead it was before, but the 9900, still... yeah, it's, it's, it's tangible. You can see it on the charts. Look at anybody's review. If you're gaming at lower resolutions, whereas that's when you're really forcing it to be more CPU bound, that's when you can prove that, okay, yeah, Intel still does have the advantage with, with gaming. You know, it's, I mean, it's interesting to look at because you're, you're getting, you know, I mean, one on like the Far Cry 5, which is kind of funny. The 3700X is, uh, you know, 3.8 frames per second faster than the Ryzen 7 3700, or the 3700X is 3.8 frames per second faster than the Ryzen 9 3900X. Um, but, you know, you're looking at 142 frames per second, almost 20 frames per second faster for an i9 9900K. But you know, you're paying a lot more money for that. Um, no, actually, you're not. I take that back. Well, um, it, it depends on which one you go with. Yeah, if you were to go with the 3700X, it's only 329. So yeah, the, and and Intel's actually the better overall performance ended up being the i9 or the i7 9700K, which is right. that sort of interesting eight core non hyper threaded part. So the performance of that, if you're talking about like software mitigations or you know some of these mitigations they've had to put into place, and I was running all of this. Part of the reason this was such a, a daunting task was I had to redo every benchmark. Couldn't reuse anything old because I had to start from scratch on 1903, the newest version of Windows 10, right. which had scheduling improvements for Ryzen and also had you know more more of the mitigations uh, uh, coupled with the fact that I had the latest BIOS updates on these boards. Right. So even even so, the 9700K just kind of blasts through gaming because it's just eight fast cores, no no SMT. No worries there. And it's kind of the better chip. If I was just going to buy an Intel chip today, and actually I might be using the 9700K on the gaming test bench going forward. But, you know, it's... But still, I mean, the, the differences in, in frame times and overall frames per second averages between the latest Ryzen... We haven't tested any Ryzen 5 yet. I have a Ryzen 5 that'll be coming soon. But it's pretty minimal. It's not like a 20% disparity like it was in the beginning when Ryzen first mm -hmm. came out. So if we're talking single digit disparity and you're getting much higher productivity, much higher like workstation stuff, it's, it's the same story that we've been talking about right. for the last six months, eight months on this podcast, which is more cores for less money. And until right. Intel changes their, their product stack until they change pricing, revisit HEDT somehow, and HEDT being like the sort of step down Xeon parts that we've always been able to get, like Ivy Bridge E and Skylake E and all of those hyper expensive, you know, extreme edition processors that are out there. But, you know, this changing the game, 499 hmm. to 749 when the 3950X comes out, that's going to be a crazy part too. $750 for a 16 core 32 thread part at 105 that's gonna watts. be it's going to be interesting to see how that does on some of the the multi-threaded benchmarks i mean you know i i gotta say the core i7 9700k is a compelling processor at, at you know 365 dollars um but i spend so much time doing stuff that's all multi-core all the time and it's kind of like oh hey 